welcome Pastor Mark up today. By the way, be, be easy with Pastor Mark today if he's a little slow. The two of us went out for Mexican food last night, and he had a taco salad that was bigger than our baptismal font, They're for bigger sure. Bigger than the bass drum up there. It here. was enormous. So if he's moving around a little slow today, we had a lot of and calories. And the chips and salsa. Yeah. And, and the, the sopa peas. And the fried ice cream we had, too. Oh, my goodness. It was bad. I'm, I'm kind of hungry for lunch now, guys. I'll just wrap it up here, and we'll go home. No, I appreciate it. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good to see you. I know when uh, Pastor Jeremy uh, introduced me at the first service, uh, he said, uh, there's our illustrious Pastor Mark with a fantastic sermon for you today. He's been working hard this morning. I know it's a wonderful message. And Well, now that he's heard the sermon, he didn't say that this time. So, <laughs> so it's probably not a great sermon, but the topic is very interesting, all right? So maybe a little more teaching, a little less jokes, but... Uh, it's super, super interesting. So, the end of the world. What's that? What's it like? We, you know, how do we know to ex- what to expect? Will we recognize it? When is it going to be? Pretty fascinating things to just imagine, right? If not to ponder, if not even more to just study and, and, and really look in deep and try to learn what we can learn and what's true. And so... Uh, you know, every sermon has started with a cross something, cross walk, cross word. So today is cross reference, right? We want to cross reference whatever we hear around us because it's very exciting, fascinating, sensational even, uh, ideas about what the end is like. Uh, it's not going to be a zombie apocalypse. I'm sorry. I know some people are prepared for that, but uh, that's not what's going to happen. Um, but it is very fascinating and sensational, and a lot of people try to speculate, and, and they get famous, some people with their ideas, and it spreads like wildfire. So we're going to specifically talk about a couple of things uh, as we go through. Uh, but the main thing here is that, whatever you call it, the last day, judgment day, the day of the Lord, the day of Christ's return, these are all Phrases that are used in scripture to refer to this one singular event uh, when Jesus comes back. And a word, a Greek word that's used over and over again in the New Testament to talk about the end is the word telos. And uh, say telos. Yeah, good. You speak in Greek today. Telos, it does mean the end, but it also means the goal. Right? Think about the end of a race, the finish line. Right? It's the goal, it's the end game, it's the ultimate purpose. So when we talk about cross purposes, we've been talking about different aspects of how what our flesh desires, which is something that's fast, it's easy, it's pleasurable, versus what God's purposes are, which oftentimes are contrary to what our flesh wants. And I can't think of a bigger, more stark example than the last day. I mean, what is the telos of our lives? Is it to be happy, healthy, wealthy, and wise? I mean, if this life were all there was, I could make an argument for that. But there's more to this life than this life. And so the telos, the ultimate goal of this life, is to live in that perfect creation from God and our perfect bodies in communion and fellowship with our Creator and our fellow humans. That's the ultimate goal. You should always have at least one eye on that prize, on that finish line. Now, this is Lent. We're leading up to, to Holy Week, the Passion of the Christ, and then, of course, Easter. When it was happening, as Jesus was getting closer and closer to Jerusalem, he started talking about the last day when he returns, the very end of time. And I have to think that as he got closer and closer to the cross, right, he wanted to remind himself and he wanted to look past the cross to that last day where he returns in triumph and all is made right because of the cross. Right? He can forgive sin and take it all away, make everything right again. So, again, as Jesus is approaching Jerusalem, he, he teaches about the end times. And from our gospel reading today, about that day, Jesus said, no one knows the hour or the day. No one knows. 
Not the angels, not the Son, just the Father in heaven. No one knows the day or the hour. But that doesn't stop from speculating and calculating whatever, edumacated guesses, right? Uh, of trying to predict what the scriptures do not say. We've all heard of many different things. Uh, and actually, this has been a, a thing for, throughout history, you know, for centuries. Uh, people have said, oh, this is going to be the end, the Middle Ages, this year is going to be the end. Well, this is just a few examples from our own lifetime, most of our own lifetimes. Um, oh, that's right. The kids went to church. Everybody was here in 88, right? Maybe not you. You weren't born yet. Um, so a guy was handing out pamphlets who said 88 reasons why the rapture is going to happen in the year 1988. Well, how did that work out? Yeah, 88 reasons were wrong. Um, and, uh, uh, well, anyway, uh, the Mayan calendar. In 2012, everybody got really excited. Because the Mayans had this very accurate, precise calendar. It had been centuries, and it's still accurate calculating. You know, we have to add a leap day, you know, to our calendar. For every, to, whatever. They were still on, on track. And they, their calendar just ended, uh, I think it was December 12th or something, uh, in 2012. And everybody thought, whoa, that must be the end of time right there. So there were a lot of people who got excited about that. You got to follow along. And how did that work out? All right? We could just cite example after example. Uh, when somebody picks a specific time. And then also it doesn't stop people, though, from, from just being fascinated and, I don't know, a sensational. I keep coming back to that word, right? This whole Left Behind series that was so popular uh, years ago uh, just blew up. And it was so everybody's reading these books. They made movies after movies, sequel after sequel. This fictional story about supposed facts about the end times because it is so sensational. So you think about how, well, let's just be honest, confusing it can be to try to figure out how we're going to know when it happens, how we're going to recognize the end times and the last days or when Christ returns. But think about Christ's first return and how confusing it was for them. Imagine their expectations of what this long-awaited Messiah would, would look like. And imagine their speculation. All the people of Israel, right? All. They've told the stories. They've read the scriptures. And, and they were waiting and waiting and waiting for God's Messiah, his Savior, to come and rescue his people. What would that look like? Well, they had God's word too. They had what we call the Old Testament, right? They had all of these books. The law, the prophets, the Psalms and writings. All these scriptures that had very specific, detailed prophecies about this Messiah, the Savior that God was going to send. Among them, from the beginning of the book, in Genesis, in chapter 3, God promises that the Messiah is going to be a serpent-crushing child, a descendant of Adam and Eve. And he told Adam and Eve that. We know that he was going to be a descendant of King David and that he would rule justly the scepter of Israel and his kingdom will last forever. We know from a prophecy in Isaiah that he would be born of a virgin and that he would be called Emmanuel. It's Hebrew, which means God with us. We know that, another prophecy, he would be the Lion of Judah, this mighty warrior from Judah's tribe, conquering all enemies of God's people. That his birth would be announced by a star. And then Isaiah 55, we call it the suffering servant. That whole chapter talks about how this Messiah is going to be rejected and beaten and killed. So we've got all of these specific details. But the people were standing there and, and kind of peering into the future, trying to imagine, what is this Messiah going to be? A mighty lion? Or a murdered lamb? Seems quite different, doesn't it? And you got to understand the the you know the history of the Israelites. They had been through so much. They had been conquered by foreign armies over and over again. At one point, the temple was destroyed, and they were taken away from the land into exile. 
And God freed them. They came back and they rebuilt the temple. And then at the right time, at God's perfect timing, when the Messiah did come, they were occupied again. They were under the thumb of another enemy, the Roman Empire. And so you can understand why they would want so desperately for the Messiah to come in as this Lion of Judah, this mighty warrior, to kick out the Romans, to reestablish the Israelite kingdom as prominent in the land. Okay, here's my professor moment here. There's a little teaching point. So there's something about these scripture uh, prophecies. We call it a telescoping prophecy. A telescoping prophecy. You think about layers. So if you were to go outside and here in the valley, just pick a mountain range, right, in any direction, right, you look at the, the mountains through your telescope and you can see kind of this is in front of that one, you know, maybe the layers, but they kind of look like they're right next to each other, don't they? Or maybe right beside each other. But if you were to fly over the range, you could see the peaks might be miles apart, actually. So when a prophet like Isaiah in 700 B.C. is peering into the future, 700 years, 2,700 years to today, right? And he, he sees this, this prophecy of, of the Messiah, it maybe looks like these two things are right next to each other. They're layered right next to each other. But as you go over time, you can see that they're actually, those peaks are actually miles, well, centuries apart. And Jesus taught this to us. And we gloss over it too often. Actually, I'll just say this as Lutheran Christians, we gloss over this whole topic too much, the end times. Uh, but Jesus, in Luke chapter 4, this is just homework, this is bonus, you don't have to pay any extra for this. Um, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus goes to the temple. This is young, young Jesus. He's in his uh, you know, beginning of his ministry. And uh, he, he gets the scroll of Isaiah uh, to read to the people and to expound upon. Uh, that's kind of how they did things. And he was a guest, an honored person. So he, he, he turned to Isaiah chapter 61. And he read Isaiah's prophecy about the Messiah that said, uh, the lame will walk, the blind will see, the deaf will hear, kind of this restoration, uh, this, this uh, breaking in of the kingdom of God into this fallen, hurt, hurting world. And then he stopped, and he looked, rolled the scroll up, and he said, today this prophecy is fulfilled in your hearing. Now what we don't recognize right away is that if you keep reading Isaiah 61, you can do this at home if you want, um, it goes on to prophesy about the Messiah, about the day of judgment, the great and terrible day of the Lord, the mighty, powerful God who comes down and crushes the enemies and makes, again, everything right again. Right? But that prophecy was his second coming. And so Jesus taught us right there that we, we need to distinguish these things as hard as it is to do. Our epistle reading today in Hebrews, just the first verse, he starts off the whole book, the first verse, he says, long ago, and first of all, that makes me think of a galaxy far, far away at the time, you know, long, long ago. It's not Star Wars, but anyway, long ago, now this was written 2,000 years ago, and he's saying, long ago. I mean, that's really long for us, isn't it? But long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our ancestors by the prophets for 400 years before he's writing this, 700 years, 2,500 years. Moses is writing the first five books of the Bible. God has spoke to us through these prophets, and he's given us these details, these yeah, prophecies of what's going to happen. We've seen a lot of things happen already. Now, Hebrews, he's writing after Jesus has been born. After Jesus died, after Jesus rose, and he, he ascends into heaven. And he's saying, this has been fulfilled. And what a blessing it is for us to live kind of past the mountain range now, where we have seen what the Messiah is going to look like, what his purpose is going to be, and, and why he came the way he came. This is a real blessing. You know, hindsight's 20-20. We're so much more blessed than 
And I think the people of the Old Testament, who, again, it was so hard to see into the future. Uh, so God spoke to the people by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. In other words, God had spoken to us, kept us informed through the prophets. Now God has spoken and his word became flesh. Flesh and blood. We have a very clear picture of what God looks like. We have a crystal clear picture of how much he loves us and wants us back in his family. He's willing to do it all so that we can be reconciled, forgiven, brought back into his home. Uh, The other thing I need to point out in this verse, this is 2,000 years ago, remember, and he says, but in these last days. So when Jesus died and rose, ascends into heaven, from that point on, we are living in the last days. And if you look at any of Jesus' prophecies about the end times, wars and rumors of wars and famines and pestilence, all earthquakes, all of these things have been happening and continue to happen, right, throughout all this time. So it's really, really, really challenging and probably not wise to try to nail it down to a specific day or hour. Now, again, the confusion of the people when Jesus was walking the earth, right? People wanted, well, first of all, there were people who recognized Jesus as their Messiah, and they believed him. I mean, they followed him, did what he said. There were others who rejected him. Many different reasons, right? Some uh, just didn't want Jesus, his popularity, to kind of upset this very delicate balance of power between the temple authorities and the Roman overlords. You know, we, you know we're comfortable. Our life is good. Let's not rock the boat here. But then you also, again, you had those people who wanted Jesus, this Messiah, to come in and just kick out the Romans. Use your God powers and just zap them all and take over. And they were very upset. Jesus may not have been the Messiah that they wanted. But God did send them the Messiah they needed. If you're in confirmation, take a note so you can write that down. Jesus may not have been the Messiah that the people wanted, but he was the Messiah they needed. He's the Messiah we all need. Jesus came to defeat enemies that were far greater than the Roman Empire. Sin Death, hell, Satan, wow. And what do we expect today? So many people want a Savior who is going to give them perfect health. They want a God who's going to bless them with uh, wealth and prosperity. There's so many people that just want Jesus to be this wise teacher giving good advice for daily living. Or maybe this great moral authority, somebody who just teaches how to love everybody and, and just all be, you know, get along. There's so much more that we need. And we don't even recognize what we need or how bad we need it without God's word. Uh, again, confirmation students, you know this, right? The law, God's law, SOS, it shows our sins. When we look at the law, it reveals our need for a Savior. In the gospel, the good news, it, SOS, shows our Savior. Shows us how God has rescued us. Now, on the very first Easter, Jesus appeared to his disciples. And in Luke 24, he tells them, Everything written about me in the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms, that's the entire Old Testament. The law of Moses, the first five books, the prophets, all the book, prophecies, the Psalms, the writings, everything. All, everything written about me must be fulfilled. And what was written about him? That the Messiah must suffer and die and after three days rise and then Repentance and forgiveness of sins should be proclaimed in my name 
to the ends of the earth, to all nations, to all people. That's the telos. That's the ultimate goal. Because we want everybody to be rejoicing and praising God on that judgment day, not trembling in fear and terror. And so, we wait patiently for the end of the world, but we do not, it's not a passive waiting. It's not like we're waiting at a bus stop or a train station or you're waiting on DoorDash to show up or your water to boil, right? While we wait, we work. And Jesus talked about the, the parable of this man who owned a vineyard who went away on a long journey, who was far away, out of sight, out of mind. But he entrusted the workers of his vineyard to keep the vineyard running. They had work to do while he waited for him to return. We have work to do too. Don't get distracted about what day. Don't, don't be it so anxious that you take today's news and read it into scripture and start trying to predict, oh, this is this, per, this specific sign. This is what's going to happen. No. Focus on what's in front of you, what God has put in your hands to do today. And tomorrow, focus on what God's got planned for you to do tomorrow. And you keep going. We work and we wait. And while we wait, we also watch. Uh, when Nehemiah and his crew was rebuilding the wall in Jerusalem, this is the Old Testament times, it says that each person labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon with the other. Working and watching. Working and on alert. Ready for Jesus to come back at any moment. Now, I do apologize. Because we, we Lutherans, uh, we don't spend a lot of time talking about the end times. It has become, again, sensationalized in a lot of churches in America. And we just kind of gloss over it and avoid it. But I need you to understand that this is the telos, okay? This isn't just some extraneous or just some add-on to Christianity. It's like, well, this is Jesus and sins and, yeah, there's some end-time stuff. No, this is part and parcel to who we are as God's people. This is ultimately what we are all waiting for, eagerly expecting, excitedly anticipating Christ's amazing return. The Lion of Judah in, in glory, instantly transformed to perfect bodies, transfigured. We work, we, we, we watch so that we can share this good news with everybody else. So we don't get, we're not scared about the end times. Don't worry about the left behind books. Don't worry about rapture, none of that stuff. It's nothing to worry about. Uh, you focus on what you have. You know, what's in front of you, what you're responsible for. And get out there and, and, and use this as motivation, right, that Jesus might return today. Wow, if he comes today, there's some people I need to talk to. If he comes tomorrow, there's, some, there's still, I got a little more time, there's some people I need to call tomorrow. Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ is coming again. Amen. Let me pray. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful uh, that you have revealed so much to us about the future. It's very exciting to think about. I, I love uh, speculating and pondering and reading scripture and thinking about the news and the times. Um, while that's uh, enjoyable, uh, I pray that it not distract me or any of us uh, from the work that you put in our hands to do today. Uh, namely, loving our neighbors as ourselves. And help us to continue to focus on our tasks here while watching and waiting for you um, so that your name is glorified and that more and more people are connected to Jesus. And in his name I pray, amen.